Hi, everybody. Just waiting for everyone to get into the room. Um, we welcome you to Art Division's lecture series. And um, we're really excited about having um, Isaac Mizrahi with us tonight and um, having all of you here. We have a few people coming in. Um, we're gonna wait for the room to fill up a little bit more before we actually begin. So before we begin, I wanted to introduce Dan McCleary for those of you who don't know him. Dan is a founder and artistic director of Art Division, which is a wonderful organization um, that's been around for, we're on our basically 11th year, 10 year anniversary this year. And um, we've been in the Rampart District, which is uh, right by MacArthur Park for the, for the entire time. And we've grown from one little library space in a senior center to having one, two, three, four storefronts on 6th Street in MacArthur Park. And um, we're very proud to have a new gallery open. And it's been uh, Dan's vision that has grown and expanded. And it's a great thing. So um, let's see what's going on here. We have, we have about... Um, Half of the people are here, so I think we should get started. So yeah. um, on that note, I'm going to turn off my video and um, mm -hmm. I want to also ask you all to refrain from asking questions until the end when we're wrapping up probably in about 40 minutes and um, to just type your questions into the chat and I will um, ask them. Okay, does that sound good everyone? <laughs> so, okay. Hi, Isaac. <laughs> uh, this is something I've been looking forward to and so happy to finally see your face. We've known each other uh, in the virtual world for about three years, I think. That's right. um, and it's such a pleasure to see your face and talk to you. Um, Thank you. And uh, we're having a conversation about creativity. And um, I'll just talk about Art Division very briefly. Art Division is basically an incubator for creativity. And we're located near downtown LA. We're open to 18 to 26 year old um, youth and um, they're marvelous young individuals of uh, just amazingly creative people who, or, who I, I hate this word of underserved, but I don't know what other word to use. Uh, that's one word, uh, but they're just uh, really great artists. And I wanted to start this discussion with you, Isaac, because I have such admiration and respect for you. Um, and uh, do you want to say anything? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I would love to say that, you know, We've only met virtually, you know, on Instagram and through email, et cetera. But I feel like this is this is also something I, I hate to say, but it's true. I feel I know you because I, I look at your pictures all the time. You know, I have like about five or six of your pictures in very intimate spaces. I have them in my bedroom, Dan. So <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, I'm looking at you in my bedroom all the time. And so I have this like weirdly intimate relationship with you and you don't even know about it. So well, I'm very flattered, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, and um, Isaac, I'm, I'm halfway through your your uh, autobiography, your memoir, which is fantastic. And before we started, I was saying I relate to it on so many levels. I think, um, you know, growing up in California, you grew up in New York. It's very, you know, very opposite upbringings and very similar upbringings. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start asking you questions. Sure. And, uh, See what happens. All right. Is there one painting that you saw in a book or in person that changed your life? Um, yeah, you know what? There, 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 there is. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I used to go to the Met a lot. And, um, you know, for some reason, I loved this one painting of a little boy by Manet. Do you know that painting? It's in the- Pfeiffer, the Pfeiffer. That's yeah. his- yeah. yeah. And weirdly, you know, it's in the Met and, and I always go back to look at it and I'm not exactly sure what what it means to me. And, you know, that's the thing about pictures is that like you don't really know what it is that, you know, that talks to you, that reaches out to you. Um, and, and there's something about that boy. Maybe I relate to it because he's musical or maybe I relate to it because of the expression on his face. You know, maybe I relate to it because of the colors, you know, um, uh, Dan, I, I'm pretty sure um, I'm, I'm, I have synesthesia 
do you have synesthesia where you like where colors affect you like deeply and emotionally and you organize things according to color does that happen to you a lot or or, or what well the uh, some form of it i see numbers as color like right, the, right. yeah and I always and have, and I honestly assumed everybody did. And me too, me too, me too. And you know, Mark Morris is my best friend. You know who he is? He's a, he's, he's a really I, smart yeah. choreographer. And you know, I, I worked with him and, and for, for a long time. And I would say to him like, no, 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 darling, darling, this is not beige. This this is purple. This is this this show is purple. There's no doubt about it. This music is purple. And he would say to me, "I think you have a, I think you have this thing called synesthesia." And I didn't know that, of course, until he told it to me. You know, until he told me it was synesthesia. And then I looked into it further, and I think it's that. And I think that that picture and and a lot of pictures that I've returned to that I love so much. Right, um, always influence me most because of the colors or the layers of colors or my own personal analysis of the way those colors are, are, are layered. And, and, and it's what I respond to mostly in your work. And that's weird because the work I like the best of yours is, 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 are the white, pick, are like your white carnations and your white flowers. So there you go. Well, thank you so much. Deeply, uh, deeply uh, color, colorful. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, it's funny, the, the opposite of California from LA, the painting when I was young that inspired me more than any other was an Ed Ruscha painting called Spam. And it was a pop art painting. And this the idea of pop art, you know, and that painting, which was at LACMA, hugely <laughs> had a huge effect. It's amazing that, 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 a, that an Ed Ruscha, you know, would, would be the thing that you remember. As a kid, you remember that? Because I don't, I mean, yeah. how, how how old is Ed Ruscha? When did he make that picture, you think? Well, <laughs> I would have been 10. He probably would have been 20. 20. Okay, well, there you go. There you go. All right, just a question. Just a question. <laughs> um, can you talk about other artists who've inspired you besides Manet? Um, you know, um, I'm very inspired by minimalists, weird, because I'm not a minimalist. And... Um, and, and I would say that there's something about like um, the organization of, um, of uh oh, I seem to have lost, let's see, where did, I, where did you go? Uh -oh. You lost me? Well, I, I can hear you, but I sort of can't see. Oh, no, there you are, I see you. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, um, but I was gonna say that, that, you know, the thing that always affects me the most um, is, um, the, I, again, the idea of color and, and you know, and, and I think like, um, for instance, monolithic color pictures always affect me deeply. Like, um, I can't think of anyone's name right now, but uh, like, you know, for instance, those blue pictures, why can't I think of his name, the, the person who paints all those incredible blue pictures. Well, there's and, Eve Klein, Eve Klein. Well, Eve Klein, yeah, I think that's, that's what I'm referring to, Eve Klein. And then also um, the incredible light artist who I knew actually, and who I made, a, I made clothes for. Not um, Dan Flavin, Dan Flavin. Yeah, Dan Flavin, Dan Flavin, that, that, that's his name. Um, you know, I'm deeply, deeply, deeply in love with Dan Flavin because that is like the most fantastic, like everybody sees that completely differently from everybody else, right? Yes. You know, I, I don't know why, but something, I think Dan Flavin is like my favorite artist in the entire world. I mean that. And, you know, I, I'm so stupid because I had the opportunity when I made these, I made him a suit when he got married. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and for some reason, I didn't barter. I was so stupid. I should have bartered. Like, I don't own any Dan Flavins, but if I could own anything, I think it would be a Dan Flavin. How's that? I don't know why. There's something about it that's, very, it's like a bullseye. You know, it's like, it's about light and color. Like, really, you know, it's about, it's about the temperature, the actual temperature of color. It's not, it's like the fact of color, right? Yes. yes. That's, that's all it is. It's just, the plain, simple truth about color. And that is like, that is like, you know, touching God or something to me. You know, when I, when I see those installations or just, I think one of the most influential days of my life, when I went to recently, actually, it was in the past 20 years, is when I went to um, Dia Beacon, you know, that, you know, that beautiful, beautiful museum up in New York. Yeah, Dia Beacon. And they have these beautiful Dan Flavins that are juxtaposed next to Skylight. And it is just something so thrilling to see these 
colors that are generated by whatever it is, those tubes next to like the color of the sky or the color of whatever is coming into the room through the sky. It is really, I mean, your mind just reels. It's so beautiful, so beautiful. Yes, absolutely. And it's a yeah. wonderful Dan Flavin Museum, very close to where I live in Bridgehampton. It's a I small, small, yeah, it's a small museum and I visit it every once in a while. I love it. It's like a little old, kind of, I don't know, it's like a little barn or something. It's a structure that also Dia remade into this very small um, Flavin Museum. And he had, there are, a few, there are a few good exhibits that they sponsor every year, but it's really mostly a few installations, like a few Dan Flavins that you go look at. That's amazing. I mean, it's amazing also, um, Art Division is about to um, partner on some level with the Chinati Foundation in Marfa, Texas. Uh -huh. And I was there last weekend seeing Dan Flavin. I mean, there's five sort of chapels uh, devoted to Dan Flavin. Right. Right. Really I've never been there. I think that's going to be like a sort of a pilgrimage for me eventually to go to Marfa. Well, it will be a wonderful pilgrimage, especially because of your love for minimal work. And for, well, yeah, um, I mean, of course, like I love the opposite of minimal work too. I, I, I don't really have, but that's the thing that I think about a lot. You know, I think about like, sand back and I think about, you know, um, Sarah, right? And I think actually, I once had a fashion show at Pace in New York City a long time ago. And there were these Sarah drawings up. And I remember he was so awful. He, he, he like, he, 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 he called and he said, don't let them photograph my pictures with those clothes. And I was like, wow, you should be so lucky. But I do adore Richard Serra. And you know, my mom, who doesn't know that much about art, there were these giant, there was in the gallery at that show, there was this big giant, um, like an oil stick kind of a thing. Like it's very abstract, like it was massive and it was done on, it was just hanging. It wasn't framed or anything. It was just hanging in its natural state. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't even, um, it wasn't even stretched. It was just, you know, this raw thing. And my, even my mother asked how much it cost. You know, she was like, that's really <laughs> Like my mother who knows so little about any kind of art, especially modern and abstract art, or even, you know, simple, simple, you know, gestural things like that. But she, even she loved it, you know, so. Oh, yeah. I, totally, that's, and her, her name is Sarah as well. Right, that's right. That's right. Um, is there one book or author who changed you? Um, well, you know what? I have to tell you, Dan, yes. And it's recently that I just finished re reading all of the Proust, you know, the seven books of yeah. Memories, Memories yeah. of Trying to Capture Lost Time or whatever that series is called, In Search of Lost Time. And, and I just finished reading all of those books. And they took about, you know, three years because I read stuff intermittent with the different volumes. And I have to say, like, when I finished it about two months ago or something, I was just bereft, you know, it was like, it was, it was definitely the most um, like incredible thing I ever read. And I think because I just turned 60 or something, I'm ready for this literature, you know, I'm ready for the book. You know, it's, I don't think you can read that before a certain age. I tried earlier in my life, but now reading it was just absolutely, um, and just, just, just the beauty, the delicacy, the honesty, the truth, everything about it, but especially like, I don't know, like especially the colors in that book and 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 the fragrance of of of, of Hawthorne or something. I mean, it was it, it's so magnificent and it's so endless and so reliable, you know. And at the end of it, I felt really like I'd lost some kind of, you know, friend. And I I couldn't. I turned to a few different books. I started reading a few different things and everything felt so vulgar and kind of wrong to me. And so I started reading Henry James again because I like Henry James a lot too. So I started rereading things of Henry James. I think I'm ready now to get back into reading other things besides Proust, you know? But Did you ever read The Golden Bowl? <laughs> oh, did I ever read the, I love The Golden Bowl. What a great book. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm gonna look at that again. I just reread um, The Portrait of a Lady. Which oh, is, it is like- oh, Just ma magnificent. Just no, it just, it's like a locomotion train. It just begins. Yeah. Like, yes, and, and then the cool. end of that book is, you know, cause I, I forgot what happens in the end, right? And it's thrilling. The end of it is just so unexpected and, 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 you know, you couldn't do that in a book today, could you? You couldn't give it that crazy kind of, you know, um, 
irreconciled yet tragic yet hopeful ending that way. You'd have to decide how to end the book, right? right. You, you, you can't make art that way anymore. It's so sad to me. You know, it well, always has to be I think you can. I think I mean, there. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, just not a very popular kind of yeah. form anymore. Yeah, sadly. But. Right. Um, is there one film that had a big impact on you when you were young? I mean, young yeah. meaning like 10. Oh, well, I was 10. I mean, um, well, I, we can take like, it off. you may have read this already. Um, it was, it was, it was Funny Girl, you know, the Streisand picture, Funny Girl. Because yeah. I don't know why. I, I did you read that part yet? And 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 and, and I read about you singing. Um, what song did you sing from it? Oh, no, I I said, when you've gone to see the movie yet, I don't believe. Yeah. Oh, oh really? Well, the, the the kind of the climax of my childhood when I was about seven or eight years old is when that movie came out. Funny Girl. Yes, and you saw it in on Times Square in a big theater. I saw it in the Ziegfeld, which was which was yeah. this incredible theater, which is no longer there in New York City. It was this big theater. I do remember. And 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 it's so it's it sounds so incredibly you know alpha gay of me, but it really did change my life because I was in this kind of parochial religious Jewish school, and you know, and I kind of had like ideas about what existed in the world. But seeing that movie just kind of really made my you know my it really made my perception different of what you know of what it could be. Well, first of all, to be Jewish because she was a she was a Jewish woman, you know, and she was a lot like my sisters in that she spoke in that, that kind yes. of Brooklyn accent, yeah. but she was also fabulous. And she was also, she seemed to be such a, an independent figure, you know, Fanny Bryce and Streisand. And anyway, that was like a really, really important thing for me, that movie. Also the colors of that movie and the clothes, the costumes of that, of that movie and what women looked like in that movie was just fabulous. Everybody was so chunky and real, you know, I just, I loved how people looked in that, in that movie, in those colors. You loved, I remember you loved the makeup, which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> That's right, the makeup. It was kind of anachronistic, but it was great, yes. really great. And uh, it's funny that I saw, you were, I'm 10 years older than you, I saw it when I was 16 or so, but it, it I think, uh, you know, it's funny, it's like you just am kind of embarrassed, but the the last scene of that is magnificent. The credits where she's singing. Um, oh, so magnificent. Also, by the way, the opening credits of that movie are divine. It's it's just color again. It's these screens of Technicolor with color font and colored, like, you know, sort of colorized, like highly, highly, highly colorized um, pictures, you know, of, of, of like Belle Epoque, Kind of New York City, and then these bright colored words. It's so beautiful, Dan. If you ever have a chance to look at the credits of that movie, they're fabulous, really fabulous. I will definitely return to it. I remember <laughs> Pauline Kale gave it such a good review. She loved it and loved. Did she? Oh, oh loved it. She she was a huge defender of Barbara Streisand and just gave it a really hey. beautiful, intelligent review. <laughs> so, hey, I'm so um, glad. I don't, you know, I don't. I did never read that review. I'll have to look at it. I'm thrilled. Yeah. It's what a beautiful. great! Um, is there a recent film or TV show that inspires you now? Um, well, you know there are a few. There's this incredible show called Babylon Berlin. I don't know if you've seen any part of that. I tried, and the violence got to me too much. But all, so many of my friends just swear by it, so I'll it give is, it another. Throw. It is extremely, extremely beautiful as you get into it further and further. And really, there's nothing about it except. The extraordinary writing, you know, the storytelling, just just the uh, just the craft of it is so good, you know. The storytelling, and yeah, there's there's violence in it, but there's also incredible musical sequences that are just, I mean, and then as it gets deeper and deeper into the whole thing, Weimar Republic, etc., and the early kind of Nazi thing, and then the Nazi thing, it's really great. I'm telling you, it's really good. Thank you. I will definitely definitely watch it. Um... And what part of the creative process is the most challenging for you? I think, um, you know, that's a pretty easy thing to answer. And I bet this is gonna like resonate with almost everybody watching. I think the most difficult creative part of the creative process is engaging first, you know, like kind of digging in and going, okay, I'm gonna like 
lose myself in this. I'm just going to go away now. You know, it's like, cause you really do have to go away from everything in order to do anything. If you're sketching or if you're writing or if you're performing in any way, you, you, you have to, I, I know that you understand this, like, and, and it's not difficult once you get into it, into this kind of jag of whatever it is. Like if you're writing something, or I imagine if you're painting a series of things, like once you make that first move, then it's like, it's, it's like, that's, that's the gift you get to do that. But before I would say it's very difficult and scary. And I'm not sure why we're so scared to, to face that kind of solitude that you, you need to kind of enter. But once you do, I don't think there's anything better. And so I'm not sure why we continually are so afraid of that, you know? It's, I, I wrote down the almost the exact same thing because I was answering him and I think it's death. It's like you're, you're having to die and go to this other zone. And right. then when you're in that other zone, you're in heaven, but you've yeah. lost yourself. And then you yeah, come back. Exactly. I mean, and, I come know, back about every hour and then it's, it's weird. It's like diving off a diving board into the abyss or something. So anyway, I totally relate to that. And, and, and I think like, I, 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 I honestly, like, I, I actually once did a talk about this. I did like a TED talk a long, long, long time ago about the creative process. And, um, and, and, and it was, and people thought I was joking, but I, I'm really not joking when I say the only way to, 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 to kind of, to, to, to accomplish anything is to procrastinate, you know, like to literally jerk off, like don't do a thing. You just, and you procrastinate for as long as you can until you feel so shitty that you like sit down and do what you're supposed to do. You know what I mean? I think procrastination is the best cre tool for creativity. That's I, crazy to say, but. Uh, and watching 50 gazillion TikTok things. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, 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 and engaging, so sick of it. <laughs> engaging in any kind of social media, which is, you know, something that's irresistible. And yet, you know, no matter what, I spiral down, no matter what, no matter if I, the minute I look at social media, which I can't resist, I then immediately spiral downwards, you know? Yes, I, I embarrassingly can relate, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> is drawing part of your creative process? Um, yeah, I mean, it's always been part of my creative process. Um, right now, you know, I'm much, I'm writing a lot and I am performing a lot, you know, which I know sounds, you know, a little bit, I don't know what it sounds, but that's what I am doing. And, um, and, and, and so like drawing doesn't really come into it that much, but no matter what, I always have, you know, ideas and drawing is always, I always, I always have, I always have a sketchbook, but whereas I used to go through a lot of sketchbooks and, and do collections and develop things and needfully draw, I no longer need to do that um, as much or, or at all, as a matter of fact, not at all, you know, but right. I still, I still have drawing skills and I still have a small drawing studio here because I used to do a lot of sketches upstairs in this small room and I still have it. And occasionally I use it, but not for, not in the same kind of way. Yeah. yeah. I, I, um, do you have a daily routine? Yes. Right now, um, it, you know, it's funny because um, right now I wake up every day and I ride my bike for one hour, which is like a crazy thing. I ride it in the snow. I ride it in the rain. I ride it in the extreme heat. And it's, 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 it's incredible. I have like heated gloves and heated socks that my husband got me. I mean, it's amazing. And, um, and, and I do that because, you know, I, I feel like I'm so sedentary writing this much. And so I need to do something and it really sets me up. And again, I dread it. I dread it. And I procrastinate doing it. And then finally, I just look at it and say, get on bicycle. And I do it, you know. And again, it's a little scary because I, 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 um, I ride out, you know, I ride to like different points, right? And I think, well, if I get a flat here, I mean, there's, no one's going to find me. I'll just be, I have to walk back or something, you know, but it hasn't happened yet. I'm touching wood, I'm touching wood, I'm touching wood. It hasn't happened yet. It's been like, you know, since that's really been since the, the, um, the, the quarantine, you know, since, since, since the, the, the COVID, the COVID thing. Um, before that, 
I, I used to go to this pool in New York City every morning and swim for about half an hour, right? Um, and do laps for about half an hour. That's, that's what I did and that's what I'm supposed, that's what I will be doing again, I think when my life resumes after I finish writing this one thing and I get more time in New York City, which I've been sort of doing back and forth and I've been living here more. I've been living in Long Island more than New York City for the past, I would say like 12 years, you know, um, because we were doing our apartment over and I got in the habit of being here with my dogs and I just like it so much, you know? That's, for me, it's swimming. I swim, I try to swim every morning. I try to, but I, I mean, it's, it's, it's my salvation, you know? It's the greatest thing, right? It's a form of meditation. And when you come out of the pool, you just feel like so healthy, yeah. Yeah, and no one can reach you and you can't reach anybody. <laughs> oh, great, great, <laughs> true. Um, what advice would you give a young artist? Um, okay, well, you know, um, Dan, what advice do you give young artists? To have a fierce belief in yourself and at the same time be humble. Like don't get full of yourself, but listen to yourself and be true to yourself. Don't let anyone um, tear you down or don't listen to people's criticism. All ideas are good ideas to listen to yourself. And I like when I, and as a teacher, and I try to honor that, like whatever idea a student has, I'll be like, that's fantastic. You know, and even if it, you know, just like, and the things, <laughs> the other day a student was making an adobe mold of his head. Nice. And then he decided to put chia seeds in it. And I'm like, that's great. <laughs> like, you know, and it, I really meant it because I think it's, I have such respect for, um, I have a religious respect for the uh, creative spirit. And I think that I, I to, and for yourself, for, and for students to have that for themselves, to when people tell them it's a dumb idea or they tell themselves it's a dumb idea to try to turn that voice off and just believe in themselves. Uh, and then the other thing is to be humble, to realize you're not the greatest artist who ever lived in the history of man. Oh, and to, just work, you know. I, mean, you know, I have to say, I, I, I don't believe, I don't, I don't believe advice works. I mean, you can try to give, <laughs> but I don't believe it works. I mean, that's that's my advice. And, and and when you say like try to be humble, yes, that's a good, that's a that's a really good wish. I wish that people could try to be humble. But I also have noticed that even among the most humble artists that I know and the most kind of menschy people that I know, a creative ego is something that we are required to have in order to work. Like we have to be, we have to be thinking that we are in some way marvelous or better or great. I mean, it is a kind of a kind of propaganda or something. You know, when you any kind of idea you have, not only do you have this idea, not only do you have to execute that idea, but you also have to represent that idea. You know, you have to get on a soapbox and tell the world what a great idea it is, or no one's going to see it. You know, no one's going to notice it. And so, you know, so like as humble as you would imagine, you know, um, as humble as you would imagine artists might want to be, I also think that there is a there is a good there is a little what's that line from all about eve we're all born with our own little trumpets our own little horns and you have to learn how to you know trumpet yourself you have to learn how to toot your own horn right yes um, yeah so and, and you know I, I i honestly like as a young artist i never got any good advice people gave me the worst advice and so <laughs> I think you're smart to tell people not to take advice. That's the great, I think that's the best piece of advice. Don't take any advice because it's it all sucks. <laughs> um, <laughs> is your public persona separate from your private persona? Um, no, <clears throat> no, no, it's not, it's really not. I mean, I, more and more, you know, I feel like um, this person that I am is this person that I am, you know? So no, I am the same, I'm one and the same. And, you know, I, I have to tell you like, um, you know, being in the fashion business for so long, right? 
and coming up in the 80s and the 90s, and you remember what that was like being gay, right, in the 80s and the 90s. And this is maybe not exactly the question you're asking, but it does somewhat correlate a little bit, which is that, you know, I remember being a little bit nervous because, you know, I come from this very parochial kind of religious background and I rebelled against it and I left and I left it kind of in the dust, you know, and have a relationship with my mother's, <laughs> my mother, <clears throat> but that's about it, you know, like, I mean, we have a relationship and I, and I love her, etc. I mean, with air quotes, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be like disrespectful. I love her, you know, but the point is that it's, 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 it was a little scary. And I remember thinking to myself, like, you know, you can't pretend to be straight like so many other of these people. You know, there were other designers and aesthetes and whatever, and they were straight. They were getting married and they were, it was crazy. It was a crazy thing for me at 20 and 25 to like be around those people. Cause I would say like, I just don't understand this. And they were older than me. So of course they were like, it was a little scarier for them than it was for me. But I remember like thinking, you know, you can't do this. You have to just be out there and just be, you know, proud. And, 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 and when I first came out, there was like a cover story on this magazine called New York Magazine about me. And they did this, you know, this long article about me. And I very, you know, candidly and very happily told them that I was gay. And, um, and I remember seeing this one friend of mine at a cocktail party, this guy who had worked in public relations at another designer house that I had come through, you know, working as an apprentice. And he said, oh, darling, I'm so sorry that they outed you in New York Magazine. And I thought, well, I wasn't outed. I told them <laughs> that I was gay. And then a few years, like two years later, there was a big cover story of, of K.D. Lang on the same magazine. It was like, you know, lesbian chic I think that was the headline lesbian chic and then I ran into this guy again I said you see I was a lesbian way before KD Lang <laughs> that's great um do you have um a favorite place besides your home you would like to be is there another city that you dream to be in or like to be in or is home your I sense you're a homebody, um, but do you love, be, is there another city that you feel good in? I do, sure. I, I, I love being in, I love being in other places. I don't love getting there. I mean, what's more humiliating than an airport these days, you know? <laughs> um, have, have you been on a plane recently to go anywhere, uh, uh, Dan? Yes, I, I went to Texas, of all places. I went to Marfa and... Um, it was fine, you know, it, it's the, the masks and um, I mean, it was fine. I mean, I didn't, can't say it was a wonderful experience, but once I was on the plane, once I got there, you, it just, you just do it. You know, I'm going to go, um, you know, I'm going to Oaxaca in January and I'm nervous a little bit, but I just, uh, you know, I'm going to do it. Uh, and it's, it's funny, it's a little like what we were talking about with creating. It's like the trepidation of it and the airport and the travel, wow. that's the horrible part. But once you're in this other environment, it's yeah. heaven, I think. I guess, I mean, and for, for me, it's heaven. And also, it, it, I, I, I don't know why, but like when I'm away from the East Coast, or actually when I'm away from like the cities that I'm most familiar with, like Los Angeles, New York City, um, I don't know, uh, it depends. I, I was getting to know London very, very well for a long time. I felt very, like, sort of happy and well adjusted in London for a long time, too, and Scotland and all the British Isles, right? Um, but not for a minute. You know, now when I go abroad, um, I, 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 I used to go to Italy a lot, too, a lot, you know? And I um, mean, I also felt very free and happy in like Milan and Rome, etc. cetera. Um, but anytime I go to anywhere, like, sort of very far flung, you know, like Japan or parts of China, whatever, where I used to sometimes have to go, I would get like very kind of, um, you know, ecstatic and, you know, whatever, like, you know, manic, a little bit manic, right? And then a little depressed, you know, like I would go down and feel like lost and like I would never get back, you know? I, I, I turn into like a great big baby when I when when, when I travel. I'm, I'm I'm not really great traveling unless it's like you know to Venice, and then I have like a really fun time. Right? <laughs> I like Venice. I would love to go to Paris right now. There's all these great exhibits. There's that wonderful show at the LMVH of that Russian collection with all those like 
Matisse-ism. Oh, you're yeah. kidding. I didn't know that. I oh, it's like they've never been seen before and they will never be seen again. And we're going to miss it because it's only on until February. So, I mean, there's a minute we can go oh, to see it. I and then also that new Bourse that they've done, you know, they've made a museum of the Bourse. And so. Um, I would, I just getting back from Marfa when the best part was coming home to see my uh -huh. husband. And my daughter. That was the best part of the whole Of course, of course. Um, you had a major career shift, at, you know, from a fashion designer to now being a cabaret singer. That seems to be the core of your creativity. Right. Do you want to, can you talk about that a bit? Like, that's a big change. Sure. You know, I have to tell you that, um, that it isn't easy. It isn't, you know, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's what is coming. It's what is happening to me. I'm not, I'm not, you know, this is not a contrivance. This is what I'm doing. You know, and of course, if you read the book, you know that I started as a performer. I started doing yes. female impersonations. I started making puppet shows. And then I went to performing arts high school. And fashion was sort of like my, my, my way out of the house. Fashion was easier for me to work. It was easier for me to get a job in fashion. And I kind of sensed that. I knew that I would get a job and I would immediately do that and be able to get out of the house and support myself and have my own place and not need to, you know, to depend on my family, right? And so that's what fashion was. Also, I'm not bad at it. I'm very good at fashion. I mean, I was really good at that for a really long time and I still make these clothes. You know, I make clothes for QVC. It's not exactly fashion. It's more like just little t-shirts and cashmere sweaters and stuff that people are just, and they launder well and they're not too expensive and they're very pretty and the colors are amazing. And, whatever it is, but um, so you see like, um, <clears throat> it, 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 it sounds a little bit crazy, especially like, you know, my best friend is Mark Morris, who is this kind of master of this thing, which is, you know, modern dance and theater. And he, he's a master of that thing. And, and it deepens and deepens and deepens. And when I look at your work, it's like, you're a master of a kind of painting, you know, and it just gets, bigger and better and more gorgeous, you know? And for me, like I gave that up because I don't, it, to me, it was like, it did not feel right. I didn't feel right. You know, I felt it was, I felt it was important for me to kind of do that, to do what I'm doing, but to do other things, you know? And so I gave that up. And, and sometimes that's very difficult for me because of course the, my, my system of values is such that you know, I don't necessarily value someone who does all these different things. I value, you know, s someone who masters something, right? I, I just value that above someone who is the master of a few different things. I don't know why, but that's, but maybe I will, maybe I will learn to, to, to appreciate, you know, myself and eventually or something, you know, but it's not so easy. I feel pretty crazy most of the time right now. But. I understand. I think, um, you know, for me, I, I did, like 12 years ago, I, I, I got, I didn't receive that much status. I love painting beyond the beyond, but the career part wasn't fulfilling enough. And that's when I started creating art division. And these last 12 years have been the best years of my life of the balance of the, you know, the, the two things. And they don't interfere. Well, I guess you could say they don't interfere with each other, but no, no, no. they're some kind of like, blah, 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 you know, like overlap. I only have one last question for you then. Well, open it up. Oh, I guess we can do one more question and then we'll have questions. I mean, I'll ask you a question, then we'll open sure. it up. How is life at 60 different than life at 30? Do you feel wiser as you get older? Um, you know, I'm going to be honest, honest with you. It's shitty. It, it sucks. Okay. Life sucks so much more. I mean, 30 was so hard because I, I was so nervous all the time and like freaked out. And I had like, you know, no confidence and I didn't know what was gonna come. I didn't know what was happening, but now it's just like, I don't know, darling. I mean, I, especially, you know, when you read this, when you read that all that Proust and it, it's literally like, you know, over those 5,000 pages, however long it is, you kind of watch these characters just get older and older and older. And finally at the end, it's just so tragic, Dan. And I'm watching my mother who's 94 and she's like, you know, she's, you know, she keeps saying the same things over and over again, and she can't chew, and she can't sleep in the bed, and she can't hear, and she's just having a terrible time of things. And I know that this is what's coming. Like, it's, I'm not joking, like, this is it. You know, it just, 
it just devolves from here, you know? And so 60, I gotta say, really, you know, to be honest with you, I mean, there are certain moments where they go like, hmm, I'm not so afraid of that. Oh, I'm really good at that. I'm 60, I'm 60, you know? And then there are other moments when I say, shit, what the fuck, this sucks, you know? I mean, really, a lot of times. Um, and, and I have to say, one thing that's great is that I was an insomniac my entire life. Since I'm like literally a little boy, I never slept. And since the pandemic, I've been sleeping like crazy, not like crazy, but so much better. And since I've been older, like 58, 60 years old, you know, sleeping is, is a pleasure. I can't, I don't know where that came from. And the only other time it happened to me that way was when I stopped smoking for about a year, I, I was sleeping and I thought, oh my God, you know, like that was the mistake all my life. I was a smoker, but then, 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 you know, it kicked back in and I stopped sleeping. But now I think, I don't know what it is. It's about something about turning 60. I'm learning to really love sleeping. Maybe that's because I'm like, you know, gonna die soon. I'm gonna be permanently asleep and I'm trying to like adapt to something. I don't know. That's yeah. a crazy theory. That though. makes sense. I think, I think <laughs> it's just important just to keep going on the ride, stay on the ride. Stay and... on the ride, baby, stay on the ride. Stay on the ride, <laughs> keep watching, keep looking, you know. Keep and looking. it's, keep and it's looking. also, there's so much hilarity to everything to me, like yes. uh, total hilarity that yes. has always been there, but I, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but that just the hilarity and the the tragedies just keep coming. I know. <laughs> you, oh, I know. Well, they I just know. keep coming, and you just kind of like go along for the ride. And I think it's also for me to be a good person and just be a good person, you know, and do the best you can. <laughs> and the best you can, you know, no one's perfect. Yes, but... To do the best you can, yeah, yeah. And also, okay. you know, I'm gonna, been... what? There are pleasures, darling. There are pleasures in life. Oh, I mean, yes. Food yes. is a pleasure. Sex is a pleasure. My dogs give me so much pleasure. I mean, right? Yes. Theater yes. gives me pleasure. Even when it's bad, theater gives me pleasure. You know? <laughs> I kind of almost like hating something more than I like liking it. <laughs> to... And there's all this music, you know, mu great music being written and performed. Yes. And, yes, yes, yes. Um, all right, I'm gonna, Cindy, am I calling you back? Cindy. Yeah, hi, I'm not gonna show my face, but I'm gonna ask some questions. Can you hear me, everyone? I can hear you 100%. Okay, I have one question here. Uh, for Isaac, which is what commonalities exist for you among your creative endeavors, like fashion design, writing, and cabaret singing? Like what is a common thread? Um, you know, um, I, I, I think the common thread is humor and color, those two things. Um, and, you know, by the way, like the cabaret thing is, yes, it's some singing, but it's also a lot of storytelling and a lot of joke telling, you know, I mean, that's, that's a big, that's a really big, I mean, I write these shows, I write them. And, and the songs are like, weirdly, um, like sort of interludes for me, like, that's the easy part, the singing, because I love, my band is incredible, and they make everybody sound good, and I make them sound good, and we work together great, you know, and, but, and you're with them, and you're doing this thing with them, and so, everybody's responsible for that, right? And so I'm not the only one doing that. But then when I'm talking to the audience, telling them and kind of narrating whatever this arc of a show that I do with songs, you know, that's my responsibility. So if they're not laughing or enraptured in some way, I'm failing. And that's what really makes me so nervous. But usually I get my footing and, you know, and it works, so. Okay, here's another question. It's an interesting question for both Isaac and Dan. Um, it's from Vanessa Melesio, who's an art division student and emerging artist. And their question is for both of you. Can you describe how social media impacts your creative work or expression? And does it add to your creative practice or detract from the art itself? Isaac? Dan, you go first. Um, well, on the most pragmatic level, I sell a lot of work through Instagram mm -hmm. and it's been delightful because um, I can't, art openings are terrifying to me. Um, I have to take now herbal tranquilizers to get through it. I'm not, I'm an incredibly, um, what's the word? I mean, that's the, we're talking about the, I'm very shy and, and, and some form of an introvert, I guess, but 
Instagram has been great. I love looking at other people's Instagram sites. And, you know, my husband is like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm doing business. You know, it's business for me. I, I do a lot of business. Social, I think um, there's an article that came out in Atlantic about how the algorithms is ruining everyone's life. It's absolutely true. You know, so I think it's horrible. Uh, but I think it's just here. I also, um, I don't want to, that's enough. Isaac, you'd say some more now. You no, it's me. not. I think, you, I think you've, you've hit on that, which is like, you know, a very scary thing. It's a very scary thing. Um, I think it, it, it feels so kind of game changing more than generation to generation to generation. You know, how like impressionists felt from, you know, whatever, the neoclassicals, whatever. You know what I mean? It's, it's more than that. It's, it's more substantive than that. It's about like people's attention span. It's about like reducing everything to a 90 second clip. You know, I, I don't know if I believe in that so much. And yet I am, I am in love with that form. I love that form, you know? And, and I, I feel like we're on, the, we're on the tipping point in so many ways. You know, that's just, that's just one thought that is accompanied by so many, that is just one, you know, sort of symbol that is accompanied by so many things like global warming. God knows what's gonna happen to the world, really. I mean, so much more than like our parents who worried about the Cuban Missile Crisis or, you know, I don't know what they were, atomic, nuclear, whatever, but we are literally looking at the most terrifying thing. So, these are very, very, very big, big, big concerns, you know? And, and, and the only thing I can say is as a, as a real optimist, which sometimes comes across as pessimism, you know, like sometimes it comes across, like I am the first one to say that it's, you know, later than you think, and it's, we're all gonna die, you know? But I think like deep, deep, deep down, I am a real optimist. And, you know, I'm looking at this in the next 100, 200, 300 years, I think, something is coming, something incredibly beautiful, like some kind of renaissance, you know? And I've been thinking this since I'm a kid, like so much is in the past, so much is in the past. And since I am an adult, like no one has come forth and said like, this is the meaning of things, you know? Like the way they did before me in generations where, you know, you had Picasso who said, this is the meaning of the damn thing, you know? And then you had all these cubists and all of these phobists and all of the, you know, right? And it just all made sense. And so far, like, you know, I mean, here and there you have a, you have a, a sort of a postmodern movement, you know, whatever it is, it's all little sort of gasps of things, you know? But I do feel like a Renaissance is, is afoot. I feel like, especially the COVID thing, like, that's forcing people's hands. That's making people respond in a certain way. And I'm not exactly sure when or whether it's going to be a result of some kind of revolution or something, but I do see a wonderful kind of renaissance. God, that was a really long, impassioned answer. I apologize. And I also think whatever that you asked. And so I answered. <laughs> But I also think, Isaac, what's happening right now, me talking to you, is a product of, of it all. And our friendship has developed on these little, I know, post, exactly. these little postage stamp screens. But, <laughs> but you know, so, And I don't think it's going to affect when we actually meet in person. It's not going to be awkward, but uh, it'll be interesting to see you in three dimensions, but it, you know, it won't be awkward. So. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. That was a good question. Are there more questions? Yeah, there's a couple more. And um, I have it's for Isaac, but I know that uh, Dan has this um, says, Isaac, I bet you're a great cook. Are you? I know that Dan is. So just wanted to know if you both shared that. <laughs> um, you know what? I am a really good cook, I have to say. And that's because I you know, I'm old, you know, usually when you're, by the time you're 60, you've roasted so many chickens and you've, you know, you finally know how to beat egg whites so that they inflate in a certain way when you're making a souffle and they don't get, you know, right? I, you understand like what- Oh, you, yes, you're, you're speaking our language. You have no exactly. problem. So, 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 so yeah, I'm, I'm a very good cook as a result of reading recipes, right? Also as a result of being able to just know how much salt goes on something. You know, it's, it's experience and it's knowing little tiny things like, oh, no, don't put that in a hot pan because if you do, you're, you know, right? You just know after a thousand times of putting an egg in, in, in the wrong kind of heated pan, you're going to get a terrible egg, you know? Um, and so, so that's why I'm a good cook. Um, 
And, and I have to say, you know, the one thing I hate so much is when they say that it's done with love because I never find that cooking with love matters. I, I find that the more dread and fear you are filled with when you cook, the more delicious the food is comes out. I'm not kidding you. I really mean that. I am always, when I cook for people, I am a mess, you know? Um, when I cook for Arnold, I'm very relaxed and the food is delicious. But I mean, you know, when you're making something monumental, like, I don't know what, like a big baked Alaska or something, or you're making some really long thing, it's, it's, it requires focus. It requires your back to hurt a little bit. It just does, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's keep going. It's fun. It, it's, yeah. it, we're okay time-wise. Uh, yeah, so. we're, we're still okay. Um, it's... Um, we have about 10 more minutes. Um, I have one question that, that goes back to your fashion career, Isaac. Um, someone is asking, could you fa share a portion of your design, fashion design part of your life? And if you were designed today, what would it be? Um, I have to say that, um, you know, the thing, the thing that's funny about me and fashion is that I really followed a very kind of base instinct as a fashion designer I, I it wasn't it was it was very unthoughtful it was just it was just this kind of thing like I was raised in New York City I went out a lot when I was in high school I went out a lot you know to like different discos with my friends and we were very naughty we did terrible things you know as, as teenagers and it was fun it was really really fun and I got into noticing what people wore and that's what made me a good fashion designer you know fashion is really about like sort of you know pre predicting what people are going to want to look like next you know and sometimes you're a little too soon and sometimes you're a little late but fashion is that moment that you go like here's what you're going to want in six months or a year or whatever it is. And you're right or you're wrong, you know, but it requires, a, I think it requires a real kind of youthful vigor and rigor and, and, and interest in the subject. You know, like I don't, because taste and beauty and all of that was inbred. You know, that's what was, that's what I brought to it, you know, but fashion, fashion, darling, fashion is for the young. It's for the young. And, 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 and when you see an old person do it, it's never as good. You know, usually you have these old houses where they have young people working for the old house going, oh, no, 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 darling, not that length, not that shoe, not now. It's this shoe, it's this length, it's this makeup and this hair. Like that's what goes on, you know? And that's what the editors know that I don't know, you know? So for me as an old person, I don't want to do fashion anymore. I just don't want to do it. And I'm almost embarrassed by the whole gesture. It's so like, it's so sort of, I don't know what, it's so exclusionary, you know, it's like, you don't look good and you don't look good and you don't look good, you look good, you know? I don't, I don't believe in that. And I find it to be like, I'm, I find that I'm a little embarrassed after all these years that I did it for like a good 15 years of my life. You know, I was like the king of the whole thing. And I, I'm a little embarrassed, I have to say. Really, Dan, a little embarrassed. Um, I'm going to turn back, turn my video back on so that I could um, actually, um, here I am. <laughs> I want to thank you both. I want to thank everyone for participating and, and posing such great questions. And um, what a fun evening. What a, what a great way to get to know you, Isaac, and to get to know Dan a little better, too who I've known for a long time. Thank Great. you, Cindy, you did a magnificent Thanks, job. Cindy. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Isaac.